so let's get started. So l- l- today we're going to go through a practical guide to medications, but the hard drugs. So we're going to go through opioids and a few of the, a few of the other stuff, um, like ketamine, for example. And I'll just keep admitting people as people arrive. And yeah, let's get started. Um, so again, ground rules. I'm going to ask lots of, <laughs> lots of questions. You know, I don't care if you get the answer right or wrong. It just makes an interesting discussion. And it's, it's really interesting. I've been doing a podcast for the first part exam and we've, we've actually, well, my, my colleague who does a really amazing job and he's such a nerd in the best way possible. He looked at the, the Bible of anesthesia, found out that one of their, one of their sentences was questionable and then said, you know what? Miller's anesthesia is wrong. And he just did some, his own simulations on some special gas man program for anesthetic pharmacokinetics. That's the level to which this guy went to, to prove the Bible of anesthesia wrong. Uh, and then we we put that up and, you know, got a lot of good feedback from that. And then the very next episode, I wrote something wrong. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but it's just one of those things where you just got to laugh at yourself for making these mistakes. So anyway, safe place. And yeah, I'll ask you lots of questions. This is me, all my usual details. Um, that's the podcast and that's the YouTube channel. Please, um, yeah, I'll just keep adding these slides and these videos uh, to those channels. And uh, yeah, as we go along. So... Again, uh, as I mentioned before, this is the same one of the same slides that I gave you. This was my first part notes for for opioids pharmacology, and it's just so much information, and it just hurts me that I spent hours memorizing this stuff. Uh, but essentially, I want to get down to the absolute detail that is crucial for your practical knowledge in this, and to keep you, you know, safe practice. That's pretty much it. Uh, so I'll synthesize this table into something far more reasonable, but also I'll I'll do less of the anesthetic drugs, but I'll give you a bit of a taster of that. So again, aim is to cover the essentials of these medications, how this knowledge can help you as a junior doctor, and then give some real life examples to hopefully make you a gun intern in three years time, or two years rather. Now, so opioids, let's get started. Essentially, these are the things I want to get through. You know, what can I actually prescribe? So again, practically speaking, when you get out as an intern, you'll be wondering about every little thing you prescribe from the, flu- the first fluid bag you do to what rate, to what volume, uh, to how to prescribe paracetamol and everything. So I just want you to give, give you a really good framework to start with. So, you know, if you kept these notes into, you know, into in the next couple of years, you'd be very safe and appropriate in what you're doing. With the EMI, it gets a bit easier as well. I just want you to make sure that you have that knowledge so you can prescribe something in writing if you needed to. Uh, so what can I discharge my post-op patient with? What are the risks? How do I prevent these risks? Or how do I mitigate them? How do I treat the complications that could occur? And when should I call the pain register? That's one of the most common things you'll be tossing up. And how about ketamine? When does, when does that occur? When do I prescribe that? Or can I prescribe that? Um, just quickly, uh, is there anything else anyone wants to go th- through uh, in the next hour or so? Yes. Sorry. Hi, it's Freya. Um, yeah, go for it. I just wanted to go through, I wanted to go back to local anesthetics. Um, we Just briefly, I promise. But I just wanted, and we probably don't need to know, we probably at the end of the day just need to know clinical stuff like, which ones to prescribe and the dose and the toxicity. But like yes. last year we very briefly touched on like their actual mechanism, which is about like opening sodium channels and stuff like that. Yes. I just never fully understood that. I was wondering if you could just briefly touch on their mechanism. And also I was wondering if, sorry, I was doing a bit of like pharmacology <laughs> revision before. Um just wondering, you might not know, but how, um, uh, which one is it? How um, the, the mechanism of opioids and cannabinoids yep. seem to be, seem to act on the exact same pathway. So I don't understand how they're different. Ah, okay. So the answer to your first question, nerve transmission is all based on sodium channels. And, you know, we, we, we uh, obviously, we won't go into detail on that, but there's a re- there's some great diagrams. You could probably just Google this. If you look at nerve transmission, you'll see that it's this cascade of sodium channel activity across the nerve, across the neuron. Now, local anesthetics block those sodium channels 
And that's where the inhibition of those impulses will be, whether it's a sensory nerve or a motor nerve. Uh, as far as you're concerned, it's going to be sensory nerves that get blocked. But, you know, when we give a spinal anesthetic or even deep regional anesthesia with potent agents like, you know, 2%, 1% lignocaine or 0.75 repivacaine or 0.5% bupivacaine, you also get a motor block. Now, that's as really, that's as far as I need to tell you anything, because then after that, the relevance of that is if this agent blocks sodium channels on nerves, it will block sodium channels potentially in many, many other organs as well. And that's where you get your neural toxicity and your cardiac toxicity. Um, that's, that's all I've got to tell you. Uh, any more detail than that is something that I don't practically use and something I probably knew back when I was doing my first part pharmacology. And you know, if I was to tell you and go through more detail with that, then it'd be use information that you just won't use until you start doing special specialized stuff. Uh, in answer to your next question, I actually don't know a lot about cannabinoids. So many agents act on many different receptors in many different fashions. So for example, if you, you know, we'll mention a drug, drug called Largactyl, um, I think it was named because it had a large action. So it, it uh, you know, uh, took on many different receptors, dopamine, histamine, whatever. And so whether an agent is an uh, antagonist and agonist, a competitive agonist or non-competitive agonist, all of these things will change the way the cannabinoids might act at the, uh, you know, at the um, opioid receptor and therefore change the way it acts. Now think about that complexity, but also how distributed the cannabinoids are in the body and what the method of intake is, for example, IV access to something. If I gave you IV naloxone, it goes straight into your blood and antagonizes the opioid receptor. If I gave you oral naloxone, it goes straight into your stomach, goes past the liver, gets completely taken away from, uh, from circulation by that liver. So suddenly the very same drug has completely different effect because of the route of administration. Uh, so the way you'd want to find the answer to any of these questions would be in, so in that circumstance, cannabinoids, what is their pharmacokinetics? What are the pharmacodynamics and how does that then, you know, ch change the way it acts? But again, uh, you just won't need to know too much about that. Um, yeah, great. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, good question. Okay. Let's keep going. So this is the kind of table that I want to fill out uh, for you guys. So we're going to go through which drug, the doses, the risks, and some special features. And there's only a few things in each category, but again, I want to make this as practical as possible. I'm trying to find the best place to put the, uh, yeah, definitely need a massive computer. That's what I need. Okay, here we go. Okay, case one, I want you guys to think about this. What are your options? You got a 50 year old, 80 kilogram male for an inguinal hernia repair under a general anesthetic. Now I want you to think about all the different opioids you could use. Uh, so just think about the next 10 seconds. Just think about all the names you could use because once you know all the different variables you have, I'll just give you the only ones you need to know. So Freya, because you asked a question, I'm going to ask you that question now. <laughs> uh, I knew that was coming. Yeah. Um, I'm reckon? just going to take a step in the dark and Go say morphine. Morphine's one of them. Absolutely. Give me another one. Another opioid. Um, another opioid you could use could be, uh, oh, is it? Um, no, I was going to say, oh, what did we learn? I can't remember. Sorry. No, no, that's right. Thinking, we learned them all last week, but I've sort of <laughs> forgotten some of them. That's all good. Um, Corrine, is that? Yeah, co codeine is an opioid-like drug. It's you know obviously you know you know over the counter, uh, but it, and it has very specific effects. I won't actually go through codeine much because uh, if you need to give codeine in the therapeutic doses, there's a thought that uh, panadine itself, which is what is it, only six milligrams or eight milligrams of codeine, that's subtherapeutic, and you actually need more to have the, actually have the effect. There's plenty of people who be poor metabolizers of codeine that won't make it transform into morphine, therefore have no actual analgesic activity except giving you constipation and maybe some antitussive effects. So really not a great agent for in, in many ways. And then some people might have an overreaction to it as well. So uh, codeine is something as a pain, you know, pain specialist or as an anesthetic specialist, I just don't ever prescribe unless it's for uh, avoidance of coughing or antitussive activity. Uh, codeine, endone is the other one that you'll prescribe commonly. Okay. Uh, and then there's other ones 
there's a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, fentanyl will be the other one that you'll see, hydromorphone, and then a whole bunch of anesthetic agents. So okay. here they are. Fentanyl's the one that's really problematic in the States, right? Like uh, with their opioid epidemic, is it fentanyl that's the big one? Yeah, there's actually so many. Oxycodone is a real problem. Fentanyl can be a problem. Then all the more hard drugs, kind of all the the fentanyls, like the um, alfentanyl, sufentanyl, even carfentanyl. There's recent articles about that, which I'll go through in a second. Now, I need you to know morphine, oxycodone, oxycontin, tarjan, fentanyl, and that's really all you have to know. Codeine, I imagine you'll rarely prescribe, or it's easy to prescribe. You just prescribe panadine, fortopanadine. And I'd, I'd say if you, needed, if you need to do that, you, you know, this, your surgeon you're working for uh, asks you to do that, that's fine. Uh, but generally speaking, it's not really part of the armamentarium of, of multimodal analgesia as we see it. Uh, and we'll go through all these in the most practical way possible. So now I want you guys to write this down. So again, just have these formulas. What do you prescribe for post-op analgesia for that inguinal hernia patient? Think about it. It's just a small incision, let's say about, you know, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters max, maybe even less. Uh, and a lot of the time you can, you know, you can, you can think about how much analgesia you need by the tissue damage and the, you know, and the invasiveness, I guess, of the surgery itself. So when I think of lap collies and inguinal hernias, it's roughly the same amount of dis dissection. Uh, whereas something like a massive laparotomy, open laparotomy, which the abdominal wound can be really large or a trauma laparotomy where the abdominal you know, wound is from ziphy sternum down all the way to your pubic bone. That's, you know, that is a big, that's a big cut requiring a lot of analgesia and other complexity. So just, um, I'm going to pick on the next person. Think about the drugs and the doses you'll practically prescribe post-op. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry, I know I keep talking. It's just when you said yeah. like the amount of sort of dissection correlates with the, is it both the amount and the type of analgesia or just the dose? Oh, it will be a number of things. So imagine if you just had um, a wisdom teeth out, all you might need would be paracetamol and non -steroidals. If yeah. you had multiple wisdom teeth with bone resection, you might need some tramadol or endone as well. Yeah. And, and that's why it's quite logical. I want you to think of each, you know, each wound as the, you know, as the amount of trauma or the amount of tissue damage. And then that way you can kind of get a rough guide to how much analgesia you want. It is actually most, most of the time it's really common sense. So yeah, it is the different types of drugs and the dose of each drug. Yeah. hundred percent. It, it's like you wouldn't use an opioid for like attention type headache, you know? Exactly. And I'm sure it'll work, but it'll be a slippery slope to disaster for your future. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. Uh, okay. I'm just going to ask uh, Cindy, what do you reckon? What would you prescribe post-op analgies for a uh, inguinal hernia? Uh, I'm just going to, does it have to be a drug on the list from before? No, it's going to include the stuff from last time. So your answer okay. is always going to be this one word or two words, and then you can give the list. All right. Maybe paracetamol or tramadol. I'm not sure. Absolutely. Paracetamol is the first one, right? And in multimodal analgesia, what's the next thing most people think of? Paracetamol and? NSAIDs? NSAIDs, exactly. Say confidently, Cindy. Either you say confident, actually, here's a rule. You say confidently, so you confidently get it right and feel like a legend, or you confidently say it wrong and the examiner or your boss second guesses themselves and says, okay, or you confidently get it wrong and the examiner or your boss says, yeah, that's wrong. And then you remember that's wrong because it hurt a little bit. <laughs> Uh, good. So uh, paracetamol, non-steroidals, and then literally some endone. So again, I really want you guys to work on the doses, especially for, you know, when, you know, you, you'll get this when you're working, when you're um, actually working, but paracetamol, one gram oral QID, ibuprofen, 400 milligrams oral TDS. Uh, and then most people would give endone five to 10 milligrams, depending on the size, depending on the age of the patient, every four hourly. That's a very standard thing. And sometimes a patient won't use any endone, uh, and you know, that that's about as, this is about the most, the simplest kind of post-op regime you'd ever get. So, yep. Just, uh, remember that again, I'll give you these slides. Will it ever be, um, pain medication PRN or will it always be kind oh. of tightly subscribed prescribed? I'm so sorry. I've, I've just done the wrong thing with these slides here. Oops. Uh, those, um, the endone was PRN. The, the uh, paracetamol and non-steroidals were generally regularly for a few days. Okay. 
Uh, I've just, can you still see that screen? Nope, share, good, I'll reshare it, easy. Can you see the screen now? Done, beautiful. Thanks for, thanks for picking that up. So yeah, this is what I do, paracetamol and ibuprofen regularly, and then endo and PRN. And sometimes you might give Targin 10 over five. So the 10 milligrams of you know, sustained release oxycodone, five of naloxone, oral, BD. Sometimes you'd give it for some other slightly bigger cases. So that would be your baseline. I want you to, I want, I want, I want to give you the baseline and then you can add to that as the complexity of things, things that increase. Now think about this. Let, let's say the patient, actually, now we will get to that. How about discharge, man? So this patient was in hospital for one day uh, overnight. Uh, what do you write up for this patient for discharge? Uh, have a think about it, and then I'll ask someone. Okay, what do you reckon? Well, I don't have names here anymore. Uh, Matt Taylor, what do you reckon? Um, so I think I think the paracetamol and NSAIDs would continue. Yep. How many days? Do you a week. Yeah, that's fair. I, I often just prescribe it five to seven days. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of variability, but pain will just get better and better as the tissues heal, just as logic would say it. And so, yeah, and it's easy and it's very easy for the patient to just get that over the counter if they need more anyway. And you just give mm -hmm. those instructions. So that's great. That's a good start. What else? Um, and then endone. Yeah, how, how, many, how many endone would you give? So let's say we continue five to 10 milligrams every four hourly. That's pretty safe for anyone. Uh, how many of those tablets do you prescribe? 10. Yeah, that, that, and that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty common prescription. Sometimes they won't need it at all. And there's definitely a trend towards prescribing less of the opioids for discharge, okay? So, you know, if the patient's in no, like I, I have less knowledge of this because I'm not at the bedside discharging the patient, but as interns, you'll notice how much endone they're using just by their chart. You'll see the patient, you'll say on the ward round, how are you feeling? If they don't have much pain and it's being controlled, you may only give five, but you'll be at the bedside better than I will as an anesthetist knowing how much the patient will need, but just know that pain will get better over time, generally speaking. That's great. Was, so, en was endone panadine fort? Is that what endone? No, it's completely different. It is a semi-synthetic oh. opioid. Panadine fort has codeine and paracetamol and okay. codeine has lots of problems. Um, so we, it, it's just an easy thing that people combine and prescribe. But as an anesthetic person, I'd say, you know, if you need opioids, don't, don't deal with codeine. Okay. That's not too controversial. It's just easy. It's easy to prescribe panadine and panadine for it. That's why. Mm -hmm. So yeah, most of the time I'd roughly do this rate regimen. Okay. Again, just starting off easy, but this will be your bread and butter when you become an intern about what you write up and what you prescribe. You can always substitute endone for tramadol occasionally. Again, 50 to hundred milligrams oral for discharge, not IV obviously, but oral QID for discharge is pretty, pretty safe. Now, now, if the patient was on Targin, there's, there's this thing, again, we're trying to limit the amount of opioids people get, avoid the, or decrease the chance of complications of opioids. And also uh, the fact that, um, you know, it, there's an addictive potential. There's a really crazy statistic. Do you know how many people might get addicted to opioids or have some level of addiction um, on discharge with opioids? Has anyone got an idea of how, what percent? Uh, someone guess, anyone. I'm going to say six. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Good. Oh, look, it was, it was 1% and that was, that seemed like a lot to me. That means like 1% of patients, let, let's say I do 500 anesthetics a year. 1% of those, so those, five people are getting addicted to opioids on discharge. That seems ridiculous. So there's a real movement and awareness that, you know, this is, this is dangerous stuff and we've got to limit the prescription. Just remember on balance, you're trying to make sure your patient isn't, isn't going to be in pain. So part of me is always uh, in, in that dilemma. I want to give them enough opioids to go home with, but, and so they don't have to, you know, go back to the GP constantly, but then, you know, you, you'd be, you'd be great to know the patient at their bedside, how they're feeling and be able to judge how much to give um, based on that discussion. But Targin is a sustained release oxycodone. So it's like endone, but just acts longer. And it's just not for discharge. If someone still needs lots of Targin, they should, probably shouldn't be going home for pain reasons. 
Okay, so that's the first case. Now, the case two is morphine safe. So think of this case. A 60-year-old male is day three post-op a bowel resection uh, and isn't doing that well. Let's say some, for some reason, acute renal impairment develops. Uh, they're still nil by mouth. They're still nil orally. And they're on a PCA morphine. Now, is that safe? What do you guys reckon? Just have a think about it. If they've got a bowel resection, does that mean that the um, mm -hmm. the constipation effect of morphine, could that be like bad for them? Yeah, that definitely could be bad. And here's one of the problems, actually. It's, it's a good thing you raised that. Uh, with a bowel resection, the bowel gets stunned and doesn't have the motility that it did. So one of the big problems with bowel operations is that, is that the bowel function stops and then slowly recovers over the time. And really that's okay. You, you know, the bowel's just had a resection. You want to rest the bowel. You want to make sure that it heals well and doesn't have all this other stuff moving. There's a tendency with this thing called ERAS or enhanced recovery after surgery, E-R-A-S. That's this whole kind of package or bundle of care to increase safety and improve outcomes for surgery. And so it's like a package of care where all these things happen. One of those things is early uh, feeding of the patient with, you know, limited, limited amounts of food just to get the bowels moving. Uh, it's still an, it's still, I guess, an area where things are still being worked on. Now, in answer to your question, constipation will be a thing, could be a thing later, but when you've had a bowel resection, you generally don't want to give laxatives and appearance because you're still waiting for the bowel to just recover. So we'll definitely get into that stuff later, but in this example, uh, not, not, not to worry about just yet. How about in, with acute renal impairment? What do you reckon? Is morphine safe in renal impairment? Uh, next person along. Damn, I don't have the names here. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find someone's name. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna just pick a name. I think there was a James before. James, what do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, okay. I'm not sure, but I'm gonna say it's unsafe. Yeah, good. And why, why do you think it might be unsafe in renal impairment? What, what, what do you think I'm talking about now? The kidneys aren't working. Some kind of hypersensitivity or uh, I'm not too, too sure. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to keep going with this because, you know, your gut feeling is right. Um, morphine, how is morphine metabolized? Uh, it's in the kidney. Uh, sorry, in the liver. Yeah. And he, look, and just, just a good heuristic for everyone. There's a rule of thumb. Everything is liver metabolized except a few things. So the way things happen, um, the liver is your powerhouse of detoxifying the body. You know, that's why it's right next to the bowel. So the bowel uh, absorbs all your stuff. It goes through the portal venous system, through the liver, the liver detoxifies as much as it can. And that's where you get this term first pass via bioavailability, first pass through the liver how much is bioavailable. So things like naloxone get destroyed at the liver. Other things like morphine get, you know, 30% is left. Now here's the big point, right? So when things go through the liver, the liver does stuff to them to make it water soluble. It so deactivates it with adding things in this particular example, a thing called glucuronide. Don't have to really know that. It, and it creates these extra molecules. These molecules are more water soluble. And so now they can be eliminated through the kidney. And that's a very familiar pattern, okay? I, I want you to remember this. So the liver processes stuff to try to get rid of it if it's foreign. Morphine, other drugs are foreign. It gets rid of stuff. It adds bits onto it, adds molecules onto it in this really amazing you know, fashion to make it water-soluble. And now those molecules are either going to be inactive or active. If they're inactive, that's great. They're not a problem, right? They're inactive. The morphine's been deactivated and now the body just clears it in, your, in the urine easy, right? Sometimes like the liver doesn't know what it's doing. You know, it do, it's not thinking about what it's doing. It just adds on these glucuronides and you know, oxygen and, you know, whatever else it adds. And sometimes it creates a more active product. This is a really interesting field because some of the drugs that you'll give people are pro drugs. So I think, uh, so clopidogrel, has everyone heard of that? Clopidogrel? That's a pro drug, I believe. Paracoxib is also a pro drug. And then some codeine is also a pro drug for pain. Codeine 
is converted to morphine and then morphine exerts its action. Tramadol can also have pro-drug effects as well. So a lot of the drugs we give, it's just a delivery system to the liver to then make the drug. And that's really interesting, right? So morphine uh, creates this thing called M3G or morphine 3 glucuronide and morphine 6 glucuronide. And both of those are active. I think M3G can have increased seizure activity for the patient and M6G is a, can be a potent analgesic. So it is, it's, it's thought that a lot of the effect of morphine can be due to the M6G. And if your kidney is not clearing it, it's just going to build up slowly and all the harmful effects of morphine are now going to be evident now. So, so if I was to get you to tell me about morphine, you know, essentially it's, it's the opioid to which all other opioids are compared to. It's the, it's the original opioid. It's the OG of opioids. Oral, IV, spinal epidural. It's got all these different formulations that it can be delivered in. So really useful. When you give it IV, it's effects in about 15 minutes. And if orally, in effect in about 60 minutes. Why is that important to you? Um, next person along. Uh, Jenny. I just picked a name. I don't know. <laughs> Michael, what do you reckon? Sorry, why is what important? Why why do you want to know the peak onset time of these drugs? Um, oh, it's an obvious question, but <laughs> I'm going to ask you anyway. So you know when to administer it? Yeah, as in you know that the most effective it is going to be, for example, in 15 minutes or 60 minutes. And what the yeah, you could think of it on that level, but I also then think, oh, after I've after I've given it maybe it's not enough. I want to know when its peak effect is for when I can safely give another dose of it. Imagine if you just kept giving it every minute because it didn't work. You haven't seen the peak effect. Therefore, you may be overdosing inadvertently. So I, want, I, I like to know the peak effect of something because then I know if it hasn't worked in 15 minutes for IV or 60 minutes for orally, then I know I, I could give some more safely. And you'll get kind of an indication of that just by knowing that information. Mm-hmm. Also, can please. I quickly ask something? Yeah, please. Um, a few years ago, I broke my wrist and I had the green whistle. I just want to confirm what's in the. What do you think is in there? So I thought it was morphine. No, not at all. It's um, oh, right. It's it's actually an ingenious thing. Like a lot of things in medicine, where something is completely not useful in one setting, then gets repackaged, rebranded, and chucked mm-hmm. in another situation. So it's methoxyfluorine, and methoxyfluorine is actually a volatile anesthetic. But the problem with methoxyfluorine is the fact that it actually had a lot of, you know, it could get you off to sleep and it could provide amazing pain relief. But if you used two hours at a certain dose, then your kidneys would, would just fail. So, you know, amazing in one regard and this just mm. completely messes your kidneys up in another way. So what this Australian company did, they made penthrain. So you can have two of those and that's a safe dose. And because it's such an amazing analgesic and it doesn't, it needs us, you know, far more concentration and delivery of the dose to be an anesthetic. It's just this really convenient thing that you can use. Um, Michael, there's one situation where you can't have penthrain. Do you know what that is? No. It's, um, have you heard of malignant hyperthermia? I've heard of the term separately, but not together. Yeah. So malignant hyperthermia is only ever thought of in anesthesia. If you give succimethonium, which is a muscle relaxant or, or if you give any volatile anesthetic except nitrous, which is not counted, you can get this like disastrous, very, very incredibly lethal condition called malignant hypothermia, which we won't go into right now. And penthrain or methoxyfluorine is one of those situations where you'd use it outside of hospital. But the question you would ask is, do you have a family history of malignant hypothermia? It's very unlikely that they do. Uh, but that would be one way someone would die if you didn't know. So I, I feel like it's worth, it's, it's worth mentioning. Uh, yeah, good. Um, and as I mentioned, active metabolites, M3G and M6G, these are renal excreted, they build up. This is one of the massive problems when you have renal impairment. Uh, so yep, caution, obviously in liver impairment, because then you're not metabolizing much of it at all. Renal impairment, as you mentioned, and in elderly, in elderly populations, everything often has a more significant effect and lasts for longer because liver function, kidney function, almost is always less in these patients. Lahiri. Yeah, please. Um, last week when we learned about breakthrough drugs, um, so morphine IV, 15 minutes until peak on till peak onset. Yes. Um, is that still classified as breakthrough? Or is that too long? 
Yeah. So you'll only use IV morphine in a quick care type setting. So if you're in emergency, you'd use it anesthetics, ICU, and in pre and in the um, post anesthetic care unit or your recovery. If you're on the ward, I'd say that it's almost impossible that you should be, it, it just wouldn't be happening. Uh, so that's probably the safest thing to say. Um, once you get into those areas, the way you'd be giving it is you'd probably get 10 milligrams of morphine and you'll give maybe one to two milligrams at a time uh, with all the other safety supports as you're doing that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah. So six, the same patient day three post bowel resection isn't doing well. They're on PCA morphine, but there's still, you know, there's, the, there's obviously that problem. What other agents can you use if you're worried about the kidneys instead of PCA morphine or morphine as a patient controlled analgesia? Uh, Amy, was that? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no um i honestly have no idea um no, i don't know yeah i don't know any that um have like what any of the effects are on the kidney no that's right and that's exactly what this is for so in that table there's a whole bunch of other medications and the only other one you will use is the endone as an iv formulation or oxycodone iv or fentanyl iv so these are kind of your options so fentanyl pca oxycodone PCA, or you might back in the old days when you didn't have fentanyl oxycodone, you could still use mo morphine. You just have to really monitor it, you know, maybe decrease the dose, decrease the interval of dosing or add low dose ketamine or something. And ketamine also has active metabolites that are renally excreted. So you'd have to be careful of that. The easy way is just to give fentanyl or oxycodone as the PCA instead. Good. Let's keep moving. Um, okay, case three, 50-year-old female, post uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Patient has seven out of 10 pain in spite of the regular five milligram endone every four hours. So, you know, you, you've done your full multimodal analgesia. You've given a decent dose of, <clears throat> you know, five milligrams endone, but you're just seeing that the nurse is charting it, or giving it every single four, every four hours, and the patient's still, still in a lot of pain. What, what do you reckon you do? Amy, I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> Um, I'm thinking fentanyl. Yeah, you could, you, could, you could change it. So by, by fentanyl, um, this would be like, ch you know, changing the patient to a PCA, giving fentanyl like that. Um, now the other thing you can kind of do is actually just, but first of all, there's lots of differentials for this. So you have to approach the patient and all the usual things you review the patient do a pain assessment because maybe then, you know, they've got some other weird pain thing happening or you do a full surgical assessment as well. Um, because maybe, maybe the lap collie has now an infection brewing. There's a, you know, there's a collection there or something's going wrong. Maybe there was a, they nicked the liver and it's, there's increased pain from that. So you want to do all of that, but because there's a pain talk, you, after ruling out the easy stuff, you find a surgical cause and you optimize a pain med. So you make sure this is one of those, the commonest things you'll get as a pain registrar where patients in pain and you look at the chart and there's no paracetamol, there's no non steroidals, there's no tramadol, there's nothing else except a bit of endone. So you make sure they're on absolutely everything. And then you might want to start by increasing. So five milligrams for certain patients may not be much. So, so knowing the, you know, the onset, how long it lasts kind of safe doses, you'll get an idea that you can probably increase, you know, 10, maybe even 15 milligrams of endone every one to two hourly, depending on if they're young and if they're quite a heavy patient. So that's something you could do first. And if that's still not working, if they're getting no benefit out of that, then you'd escalate and do other stuff, which we'll get into. Any questions about that? That five milligrams, four hourly wasn't too big. You can easily just increase that a little bit and see if it makes any difference. I just have a general question. Please. Like, why don't, why don't pain meds get prescribed like mig per kick or like, you know, based on the patient's body weight? That's a, that's a really good question. So for kids, it definitely does. For adults, it's like there's, um, the, uh, I, don't have, I don't have a source for this. When I was doing my pain kind of um, study, often analgesics effect is as much age related, if not more age related than weight related. So there's many instances, it's actually quite complicated, but you'll, it's, it's better that you, when you go into the ward, you'll start to see patterns of what is done. 
Um, but it's, it's not in so much a realm of um, milligrams per kilogram. Uh, I, I do use milligrams per kilogram as a rough guide. For example, IV morphine, roughly if I, a total dose I'd give intraoperatively will be roughly 0 0.1, 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram. But the individual doses, it, it could be anywhere below that intraoperatively. Um, endone, almost everyone gets five to 10 milligrams once they're an adult or, a, you know, uh, at, a, at a, like a normal weight. So that's, that's a really good question. But um, yeah, again, like paracetamol, once you're an adult, it's a maximum dose, four grams per day. Uh, tramadol maxes at 100. But as a kid, yeah, then, you, then, you, then you do do milligrams per kilogram. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So endone. Um, wh what is endone? Does, does anyone know much about endone? It's immediate release oxycodone. Yeah, nice one. <laughs> what else you got? That's all. It's an That's opioid. Right. What, uh, yeah, good. It's an opioid. It's, it's a semi-synthetic opioid, uh, immediate release. Uh, what do you reckon um, is the onset of endone? Who, whoever had the wrist fracture, what, what do you reckon the onset is? Yeah, it'd have to be quick. Yeah, give me a time frame. What did you uh, get it? I'm Almost assuming. instant, like 5, 10. Good, good. Seconds. Oh, seconds. It was that quick. Oh, well, now I might, I might be getting confused. <laughs> That's right. All right. Because I, I also saw a patient the other day. I think he was on PCA. I want to say it was fentanyl. I'm not sure. Yeah, PCA, but, you're absolutely right for PCA fentanyl. You get yeah. a heavy dose of fentanyl, peak effect in five minutes, but you'd see activity in one, one minute or less. Yeah, and the reason that he had it was to cough. So he was able to get his lungs you're good working yeah so but that was instant yeah it seemed yeah. so with endone again it's oral iv most commonly you'll be prescribing it orally and peak effects like 30 to 60 minutes so again i know it's 30 to 60 minutes so i've given five milligrams of endone it's not had much of an effect i might wait 30 minutes to see the peak effect before giving more you know 30 to 60 minutes half-life's roughly three hours so you'd expect that first dose to last you know uh, an amount of time around, you know, the two to three hour mark. And it's got active and inactive metabolites, but it's thought that the active metabolites aren't very active. They're not that uh, efficacious. So we don't worry too much about that in renal disease. You still treat it with caution, but you don't worry as much as with morphine. Like all medications, caution in the elderly and liver impairment. Uh, so I'm going to ask someone, uh, Hannah, what do you reckon? What's Oxycontin? Sounds like Oxycodone, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I'm not actually too sure. By sounding similar, I'm going to guess maybe an opioid, but that's as far as I've got. Really. That's right. Uh, does, any, does anyone know what Oxycontin is? I've just realized that the, I've got the names of the pe pe people who don't have their cameras on. So those are the people I'll be able to ask from now on. <laughs> is that the Tajan one? The one yeah, yeah. The it's sustained release. That's exactly right. So sustained release oxycodone. So they formulated it such that it will take longer to work. So it will sl have a slow rise, peak effect in roughly, I think, three hours and then last eight to 12 hours. Again, do not prescribe this for discharge. So what is Tarjan? Does anyone know? It's um, oxycodone and naloxin. Yeah, fantastic. It's formulated with naloxone. Why on earth, James, would they do that? I think the, the naloxone is an antagonist of the, the opioid, so maybe so, to restrict the side effects. Yeah, exactly right. Now, what's really interesting, it makes no sense to give you know, an opioid agonist and then an opioid antagonist, but you're correct. The way they do it, it targets just the side effects, but not the effect you want. Now, how on earth does it do this? Because of amazing knowledge of pharmacokinetics. So you decrease uh, opioid-induced constipation. That's what the evidence shows. Uh, and it's not for particularly long. So, so part of me thinks this is just a, a bit of a gimmick to charge more for something that's gone off-label um, when you could probably get the same benefit by just giving regular lactulose and coloxal centre. But hey, this is where we are. We're prescribing Tarjan these days routinely instead of um, OxyContin. Now, why doesn't it antagonize the oxycodone to stop all analgesia? I've mentioned it briefly before. What do you reckon? Does 
Is it to do with the um, oh. the liver metabolism? <laughs> exactly. So, so it doesn't antagonize the product. Yeah, exactly right. So you get you 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 know you t- take a tablet, you swallow it. It's got oxycodone and it's got uh, naloxone. The oxycodone in your gut causes constipation. The naloxone in your gut antagonizes the effect of the oxycodone in your gut. So that's that's all happening in your gut. But then your body absorbs it. It goes past the liver. As the liver processes it, it actually only processes maybe 30 percent of the oxycodone. So you still have sixty to seventy percent of the oxycodone in the bloodstream floating around, going to your nerves, going to your brain, getting rid of pain. But it completely removes naloxone. So that's just this amazing feature. Imagine naloxone was completely bioavailable. You couldn't do this. It would just go up into your system, and you'd be you know taking a tablet of something and the antidote, and you're getting no benefit. For example. If you were to give IV oxycodone or IV morphine followed by naloxone, you'd just have no effect. It would just be like drinking water. It's, it's nothing. So I thought that was really interesting. Just a really practical application of um, pharmacokinetics in this circumstance. So just quickly, yeah. it, um, the naloxone is completely metabolized to an inactive form by the liver. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Exactly. Completely yeah. metabolized. And there's not many things that are completely metabolized. So that's really specific to naloxone. So the obvious kind of correlation with this is that if you have some degree of liver impairment, say someone with, you know, any kind of moderate to severe liver disease, cirrhosis, whatever it is, if you give Tarjan, you may not get any benefit. So you've got to be really cautious in someone if their liver is not functioning. There's a whole reason why this works is a, is a liver functioning well. Mild liver impairment, you may have to, you know, give different doses or avoid as well. Okay, so what are your doses? Um, so yeah, just the, these are really what I'd use. Morphine, imagine you're in a situation where you're either ordering a PCA or you're giving uh, morphine in the emergency setting. Uh, we, we'd write you know, one to two milligrams every five minutes. Now, I'm kind of contradicting myself, right? I said if the peak effect of morphine is 15 minutes, then why on earth am I saying that you can give it every five minutes? It's because one to two milligrams is such a low dose that by the time you've given three doses over 15 minutes, that's maybe, you know, three milligrams, you're still not going to get to a place where it's dangerous. And that's why that's okay. And it's just easier for the patient to be able to, you know, press the button every five minutes than have to wait 15 minutes and give a bigger dose. So it's kind of safer doing it in those divided fashion. Oxycodone, as you saw previously, five to 10 milligrams, anywhere from two to four hourly, depending on the patient and the procedure. Oxycontin is often 10 to 20 milligrams BD. Tarjan, you usually write the um, naloxone component is always half the oxycontin component. So it's 10 over five or 20 over 10. So that's usually what, what happens. Now fentanyl, that's yeah, almost always 10 to 20 micrograms every five minutes. You'll see anesthetists doing bigger doses. Uh, and that's because we're very much able, like if I give a hundred mics of fentanyl and the patient stops breathing, my skill set is to resuscitate and you know help them breathing. But I'd, I'd never have given that kind of 50 to 100 microgram dose if I was an intern or a junior doctor or not trained uh, in airway management. Good. Okay, so what do you need to plan for? Now, imagine that same patient, 50-year-old, say, female, post-lap collie. What are the common risks and side effects of opioids? Uh, what do you reckon? Randy, Randy Zidhu. Uh, you might want to consider um, like how long the opiates would last, uh, but especially things like mm-hmm. the required dosage and uh, potential for abuse. Oh, yeah. uh, so let's say there's an abuse effect. Let's say I'm not going to worry about that because practically speaking, there's not much you can do in that acute setting of your prescribing post-op opioids. So let's say you're the situation, you're, you're prescribing these opioids post-op. What are the side effects of these opioids that you will need to be concerned about? Um, well, I'm guessing we discussed some of them, such as constipation and things like that. Yeah, constipation. Uh, and there's maybe two or three more. Um, anyone can jump in. Respiratory depression in overdose. Absolutely. That's a big one. Anyone who's, you know, ever been on an ambulance round trying to resuscitate heroin addicts, um, that's a big thing. Uh, anything else? 
Nausea, vomiting. Nausea. Absolutely, that's common. And the final one is sedation, uh, which kind of goes along with the respiratory depression, which I haven't mentioned there. So constipation, nausea, respiratory depression, or apnea is at, at the worst end of that, and over sedation of the patient. So if you've got these known risks, these are the common risks that happen in most of the opioids you'll be prescribing. Uh, what do you do? So how do you, how do you mitigate each, each risk? Actually, we'll just go straight into it. So same patient, what else do you write up with any opioid prescription? And look, obviously this is pretty common sense stuff. Constipation is laxatives and appearance. Nausea is anti-emetics. And then respiratory depression is a whole bunch of other stuff, which I'll tell you about. So constipation, what is your aim with your patient? Now, this is something that I don't think people talk about this enough. Uh, probably because it's to do with, you know, your patient, you know, being regular and having bowel motions. But what do you reckon, Devanshi? What's your aim for your patient's bowel motions? Sorry, what a weird question. Um, I, to, I don't know, to make them not constipated? Like, yeah, and what, what defines not constipated? Like, how, how regular um, do they have to be? I guess whatever their baseline is, so it's pro- probably different for different patients. Great, and that's a good answer because every patient is different. Some people might go twice a day, some people might go once a day. But if you had the rough guide that every patient should have a movement every like once a day, that would be a really good guide to have. So, you know, aim at one bowel motion per day or what's normal for the patient. And, you know, I, I, I do wonder, I've never been on a ward round where that's been asked, but that's probably a good question to ask. And the way I do it is non-pharmacological. So, you know, ensure that the diet is full of fiber and the rest of it. Uh, but also this would be something that's pretty standard. If you, so we're just discussing this in our morbidity and mortality meeting this morning, for anesthesia. The fact that as soon as we write an opioid, everyone should be writing lactulose, 20 mils BD, Coxal and Senna, two tablets BD. And scratch that, just do that regularly. Both, both of those regularly, not PRN. And then a Movicol sachet daily PRN if, if they need it. You're, you're really trying to get to that point where the patient has regular bowel motions because the consequence of that, bowel obstruction or you know, the, you know, severe constipation, that can be comp- really, really severe because these things happen all the time where you know, people lose track, patients don't mention it, they just think it's normal or whatever it is and people get severe bowel obstruction impaction. And if you're the intern at emergency, you'll know how bad that is for everybody involved. Okay, so that's, that's your formula for every patient you prescribe opioids to treat constipation. And you'll realize what a, a massive amount of prescribing you have to do as soon as you prescribe endone, but that's just what we do. Each medication is a really blunt instrument. It's pretty good at one thing most of the time, and then it has a whole bunch of other effects which we have to give other drugs for, and hopefully they're, you know, pretty safe. Okay. I want you guys to shout out some anti-medics. I'll start with you, Edward Nguyen. What do you reckon? What are some anti-medics you know of? Uh, God, there's one that starts with, um, yeah. I was on the rat. I was in the ward the other day. Clo. Mop. Uh, <laughs> I, I, can you guess what I'm trying to say? <laughs> there's, there's, the, there's a group of them. Chlorpromazine is one. Yes. That before. And I'll just show you the names. They're just ridiculously hard to remember. <laughs> it's almost good that we have trade names. Um, like, you know, I mean, anti-nausea, like it's pretty common. Like, you know, all of us have probably taken an anti-nausea tablet. Give me some other names. Um, there was another one. Stematil was one that we actually yep. saw prescribed. That's, then get, get this, that's prochlorperazine. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Chlorpromazine, prochlorperazine. And then there's another one called promethazine. That's for Nergen. Uh, what else has someone had? I don't know the actual brand name or anything, but just yeah. H2 receptor antagonists. 5-H2 receptor antagonists. Yeah, serotonin receptor antagonists. Absolutely. That's on Dancitron or Gronisitron. There's a few yeah. of those. The Cetrons, that's right. Cetrons, yeah. So here we go. Maxilon. I, f- I feel like everyone should have Maxilon, had Maxilon, yeah. Um, you know, big night out. Nothing like a, a Dancitron Maxilon cocktail to fix that up. So metoclopramide on Dancitron. Promethazine or cyclazine, these are antihistamines, whole, whole other group. Uh, there's droperidol, that's a dopaminergic agent. It's like hal- haloperidol, antidopaminergic agent. Um, pro- prochlorperazine, chlorpromazine, and then hyacinth hydrobromide. If you ever get quells or scopolamine over the counter, it's an amazing drug for motion sickness and it's just available over the counter. These are probably the most common ones you'll come come across. And each of the way I look at 
antiemetics, which will be a whole other talk, is there's multiple receptors and inputs into the vomiting centers, and you can target any of these different receptors through this kind of format. And I'll just give you some kind of doses and stuff. So metacoprolide, 10 milligram oral or IV TDS, that's called Maxilon. On Dancetron, uh, four milligrams oral IV TDS, droperidol, one you'll very, as anesthesia people, we use it all the time, but it's something that's really useful um, as a very, very good effect, effective anti-nausea tablet or sorry, uh, medication. Um, and the only thing is it's got this black box warning. So you just have to check that your patient doesn't have a, doesn't have a prolonged QT. So that's one of those things that has, has been around over time. Uh, it makes it a bit risky to use, but at low doses with patients without that problem, it's completely safe and very effective. Hyacine is just one tablet. You know, it's 0.3 milligrams oral QID. Promethazine is your typical phenergan. Put your hands up. Did, you ever, did your parents ever give you this on, you know, car trips? You know, when your parents ask, you know, want to do a road trip and you don't want to go, but you go anyway. And then when you're a kid, they have to give you this because you'll probably be nauseous that your dad's driving. Yeah. So uh, one, one hand goes up. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. I'm not the only one. I reckon that was just to get you asleep because that's, a, that's an antihistamine and it's a sedating antihistamine. So I think my parents just wanted to shut me up and they would give me that for car trips and plane rides. Not quite ethical. Uh, Stemental is prochlorperazine, 5 to 10 oral QID, and then chlorpromazine is Largactyl. Largactyl is also an antipsychotic. It's got a large action, large Largactyl, and that's why, um, yeah, it, it's actually used in many different circumstances from hiccups as an antipsychotic to anti-nausea as well. Good. Any, any questions about those? Uh, what so what, what I would prescribe literally for everyone getting opioids would be Maxilon and Ondansetron. That would be just the standard prescription. Give them two options. You know that way the nurse has the is empowered to give those drugs if needed, and you know isn't calling you or your colleague or your you know the, it, when you're doing night cover you just you know you wish your colleagues wrote up all their appearance, all the antiemetics, all the pain meds, and all the fluids so you didn't have to do it overnight. But it's such a waste of your time when you're fatigued and tired. So I want you guys to be really good interns and just be thorough with this kind of stuff. Okay, what do you reckon? Next patient, case four, 50-year-old male, total knee replacement, and the patient is on PCA morphine. They develop severe nausea. What do you do with that? Uh, what do you reckon? Uh, who can I ask? Anyone can jump in, by the way. But uh, uh, Samin Rashid, what do you reckon? Okay. Strike one. Tennis, what do you reckon? Um, so someone's got severe nausea. Uh, you probably want to give them some kind of anti-emetic. Uh, Beautiful. Let's say you give the, let's say you give a couple from the list before and they're still really nauseous. doesn't work at all. What do you do? Uh, maybe like PPI, not that that would necessarily assist with the nausea. Um, yes. Uh, so yeah, yeah, wouldn't assist with the nausea. Um, what, so let's say you try to rule out all the other stuff that could cause this nausea. Uh, what can you change this patient to if they're allergic to? Oh, sorry, if they're nauseous to PCA morphine. Not give them morphine. Yeah, that's a right. Different opioid. Beautiful. Can or you, not an opioid at all. Give me one to give. What's another mo opioid I could change to? Uh, not endone. Um, that one's the like really nauseous one. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I think endone IV oxycodone was, was reasonable because you can give it as a PCA. Fentanyl is the other one you could give. Uh, so here's the thing, right? So you, if a patient has nausea to one drug, it doesn't necessarily mean that all the classes of drugs will still you know, cause nausea to this patient. So it might, it might cause nausea to give fentanyl or oxycodone, but it might not. It's not, it's not that certain. So if they need strong pain relief, I would then, you know, start with a small dose of something else and then check for side effects, check for nausea, and then start them on another regime. Just know that there's variable cross reactivity with that. But there's also so many confounders. So, you know, it depends on what dose the drug was given in. So low dose of something might not cause nausea, higher doses will. Uh, the type of drug, the root, you know, oral might cause nausea, but IV doesn't and vice versa. Maybe a patient in that moment 
had some kind of surgical problem. Uh, maybe the patient was anxious for another reason or had another reason for nause- nausea. Uh, maybe, you know, they had an anesthetic that was nauseating. Maybe they ate a certain food that was nauseous as well. So there's a lot of variables to think about. So there's a lot of confounders in this. Also, uh, it's it, this, the, this whole thing about once you give an opioid, it might cause nausea the first time, but definite changes happen to your receptors. So subsequent dosing might mean that the nausea doesn't happen again. So it's, it's really variable and you just have to, you know, have a really kind of varied approach to this. But I thought I'd raise this because it's such a common scenario that you'll get time and time again. What do you do? Patients nauseous to morphine. You try some simple antiemetics, nothing works. What do you do? You just, the easiest thing to do is try another drug and then see what happens. It's really unsatisfying sometimes, but that's, that's the best you can really do. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Wow, is that already time? Um, how how long do I have you guys for? How are people free for another fifteen minutes? Beautiful. Okay, I'll try to get through the rest. Okay, case four: fifty-year-old uh, male post total knee replacement, as before, uh, one hundred and twenty kilograms, hypertension, loud snorer, and uh, yeah, followed by a prolonged period of silence. So. This patient's on the ward, snoring loudly, followed by a prolonged period of silence. What do you what do you reckon's going on? Sleep apnea. Sleep apnea. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so obstructive sleep apnea, obviously, really not great that that's happening. And what do you do? So you know, it's kind of this the stuff that you'll talk about in your deteriorating patient or uh, you know the sick patient approach. You want to monitor this patient. Uh, you want to increase your observations, maybe SATs continuously. So you can get these portable SATs monitors with an audible alarm. You might have the patient not in the back of the ward, but right near where the nurse's station is. You might have a respiratory rate monitor. Um, and then, you know, you treat all these things. You get help if they're severely obstructed with low, low saturations and apneic. You give them airway and breathing support. And then you treat with naloxone IV. So I'll just give you a few doses that... This is one of the most satisfying things you'll ever do in medicine where someone's not breathing and you'll give them a hundred or up to 400 mics of naloxone and they immediately recover. So you'll see someone maybe uh, respiratory uh, depression, apnea in a car park on the water, something has happened and you just get there. You, you know, do all your usual assessment. You might notice the pinpoint pupils and the morphine PCN boom, you give that naloxone, you saved a life patient starts breathing again, but, the adventure isn't over yet because then the naloxone wears off quicker than the morphine or whatever else they've got. And so you need to keep redosing that naloxone. So they probably need to go to a HDU setting. So that's just a little, you know, little vignette of what, what could happen and what happens pretty often uh, throughout your career. Okay. So just to go through these people, Sue, Alf, Remy, and Carr. What am I talking about? Um, synthetic opioids. This is the hardcore stuff that anesthetists get to use for surgery. So they're really high risk drugs, like so many errors could happen um, and often exclusively used in anesthesia and quick care. I'll give you a bit of an insight of the key points of difference between each of these drugs. Uh, so you'll get exposed to all of these agents or some of these agents that are available to us in Australia on the anesthesia rotation. Uh, but yeah, here's what's special, right? So they're often really fast acting. You don't have to wait too long, 30, 60 seconds, maybe, uh, before you actually see a really profound effect. Like, you know, if you give remifentanil or alfentanil, they stop breathing in like a minute. It's, 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 it's amazingly fast acting and efficacious. So they, it's not like you give morphine and they slow their breathing. They will stop breathing at the, at the, at the big dose of these agents. They're, because they're synthetic, they often have minimal or no active metabolites. So very, we call them, you know, clean drugs. You don't have to really worry about renal excretion. And they often have a very fast offset. So the bad thing is obviously they're ridiculously potent, some of them. So even a small dose, like microgram, micrograms can cause apnea versus milligrams. It can be very, very addictive. I remember I heard this concept called the gutter time of a drug. I think this was just a bit of a joke that someone told me because I've recently looked it up and there's no mention of this as a statistical thing. But the time it takes for someone to use one of these drugs and or use any addictive drug and end up in the proverbial gutter. And so I remember this mate saying, oh, you know, for marijuana, it's like six years, heroin's two years. 
And one of these drugs that we're talking about, sufentanil, is two weeks. It's so addictive. It gives you such a lipid high because it crosses into the blood, bar blood bane barrier so quickly uh, that it's just incredibly addictive outside of the um, operative setting. So these drugs have a very, very narrow therapeutic range. You get hypotensions, bradycardia is like you've never seen at the end of any medication. Apneas, chest wall rigidity is one of these weird things that, that happens when really super fast acting efficacious opioids get into the system. And if you give them for long enough, they operate, they, they have this thing called hyperalgesia. So they're not in any pain while, while you're giving the stuff, but as soon as you withdraw it, suddenly they can be in excruciating pain and requiring more and more opioids uh, in the future. So the most common one you'll use, fentanyl, peak on at five minutes, lasts about 30 minutes or longer, depending on the infusion. And its offset's really interesting. It's, it's due to redistribution and not metabolism. It's so weird, right? Because the half-life of fentanyl is longer than morphine. But if you imagine this two substance, you've got morphine here and you've got uh, fentanyl here. Morphine just sticks around in the vessel. And so it's exerting effect and the, kid, the liver and kidney get, gets rid of it. But fentanyl, because it's so lipid soluble, it just disappears into the fat and other muscle. So it gets out of the system because of its lipid solubility. It's out of the vasculature. And so it's no longer exerting an effect on, on your brain. And so if you keep giving fentanyl, suddenly it saturates and just you know, goes in and combines and, and you know, goes to all of your tissues. And then it starts seeping out and giving an activity longer than morphine. So that's just one of those really interesting things. Again, only using quick care settings or with a you know, PCA, patient controlled analgesia. And roughly this is a common prescription, 10 to 20 mics every five minutes with all the usual monitoring afterwards. And just to go through the other fentanyls a bit quickly, you'll see these on the anesthesia, you'll see um, remifentanil and alfentanil used pretty commonly in anesthesia. Remifentanil onsets super fast, half-life of four minutes. Think of how quick that is. And this is because it's, metabolized by esterases. So it's not the liver. It just met metabolized by esterases in your body, which are a massive resource. And it just cu cuts that ester bond and deactivates very quickly. So you could run a remifentanil infusion for days and the half-life doesn't change much at all. That's significantly you know, in interesting. Alfentanil, again, really fast onset due to a very low PKA, which we talked about briefly with the local anesthetic tube. There's so much unionized fraction with that low PKA in the body that it just rapid onset and roughly, you know, 10 minutes duration. Sufentanil, we mentioned, super addictive, highly lipid soluble, more lipid soluble than heroin, uh, fast onset, fast offset. Um, carfentanil recently, I think in the last few years became, I, I, I hadn't even heard of this until it came up in the news. It's really just for veterinary use. It's an interesting drug because it's so potent. So efficacy is the maximum effect of a drug and potency is how much a certain amount of drug can, have, can cause. So it is efficacious, but it's so potent that even the um, statement from the health, uh, the health website says that it's so potent that a safe dose is so small, it cannot be measured outside a scientific laboratory as domestic scales do not provide sufficient accuracy. And what was happening was people who were you know, dealing with the drug trade were combining carfentanil with other agents. And people were, you know, there's so many, like over a hundred people overdosed with um, this, this compound. So a fatal overdose can be caused by accidental skin contact with a powder containing carfentanil. So ridiculous. You just have to touch this drug and it's so potent that it, it, it's lipid soluble, gets through the skin. It's so potent that it goes straight and causes apnea. So a deliberate dose of less than a grain of salt could also kill. Um, the reason it's so potent, and it was actually used because you, you can't, let, let's say you've got a tranquilizer rhino or an elephant, literally you can't have enough morphine to administer in a syringe, imagine that. So carfentanil would be formulated because it's so potent, you can actually have enough of a volume to cause the effect you need in these really large mammals. Okay, so that's the table. I'll again, give this slide, give these slides to you uh, later as well. Um, and this, we're getting to, the, getting to the end of this talk now. So um, 80 year old female post a fall, rib fractures say on the five to eight on the right side uh, what do you do? So really you want a full doctor's ABCD assessment, a trauma assessment, and then a pain assessment. And then you know that this patient's going to be in a lot of pain. So you'll refer to the pain registrar. So the real question is when you're an intern or resident, when do you call the pain registrar? I think that's one of the hardest things to know. 
And so here are a couple of easy rules. You, you, you've started them on your usual multimodal analgesia. You've started some endone. You've increased your endone. So you've got everything charted and it's been given as well. You've checked the notes. Everything's been given by the nurse and they're still in excruciating pain. Then you call the anesthetist or the pain registrar. Imagine if you didn't do everything, if you didn't, hadn't prescribed non-steroidals or you know, you hadn't, the nurse hadn't actually given enough endone because there was a very busy ward, then the pain registrar doesn't know what to do. Look, you, you know, we haven't tried everything. So let's start trying everything and then call me when it hasn't worked, if it, ha if it hasn't worked. Or sometimes it's a, you know, cl clearly going to be severe pain. If rib fractures, multiple rib fractures are likely to be severe pain and they'll need advanced techniques. Or the patient simply has a bowel operation or it's nil by mouth for whatever reason, you'll have to give some kind of IV agent on the ward. The safest way to do that is with a PCA and we run the PCAs as part of the anesthetic department's um, you know, scope of practice. And the things that we can do then, we can start a PCA, we can give ketamine as an infusion, we can give regional infusions like those um, catheters that go around the nerves, and we can also diagnose and treat complex pain problems and refer to the appropriate resources as well. So these are pretty much the indications and this is what we can do. So what can we do for this patient? So as I mentioned, you know, obviously multimodal analgesia for this rib fracture patient, get them on a PCA, you might even start ketamine and you might start these regional infusions. And in this circumstance, a paravertebral catheter or an erector spinae catheter is something that you could use. Okay, so again, just moving on. 70 year old male, peripheral vascular disease has an above, sorry, has a below knee amputation, a BKA. You can also have an above knee amputation. I've just I forgot to take, it out, take out the above there is on everything, multimodal analgesia and a PCA, but still has ongoing severe pain and phantom limb sensation. So what can you do? And so this is where your next kind of agent comes into play. So imagine again, you've now done everything that you did right, multimodal analgesia, you've started the PCA and you've done, make sure your pain assessment is fine and um, you increase your current meds, make sure it's good, but you might want to start ketamine. So there's good evidence that ketamine decreases severe phantom limb pain and then these special stump or sciatic nerve catheters uh, with local anesthesia infusions can also reduce pain uh, and, phantom, and phantom limb um, pain as well. So ketamine, now this is, I call this the hero drug. So it's an NMDA antagonist. It does a bit of everything, a bit of analgesia, a bit of anesthesia. It's a preventive analgesic. That's how crazy ketamine is. If you give ketamine, there's some evidence to show that it will have benefits even after it's completely out of your body for the effect it has potentially on the NMDA receptor. So that's what a preventive analgesic is. A analgesic effect after the predictable action as determined by the pharmacodynamics is, has, is over. It's roughly 0.05 to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram per hour. So 14 to 16 milligrams an hour for most people. And it's got pretty much just a few important side effects. Apnea and hypertension are virtually unheard of at those low doses. For example, if I give an anesthetic, I'd give one to two milligrams per kilogram. So, you know, 70 to 140 milligrams for, for an induction dose. Uh, but the common things you'll get in these patients is they get hallucinations or increased salivation, but hallucinations is usually the one that is the worst thing for these patients. So what I say is when I prescribe this, Hey, you know, this is a fantastic drug. It's amazing for the kind of pain, you, pain relief you need. Some people get hallucinations and they see some funny stuff. Some people hate it. Some people don't care. Some people love it. Now, if you hate it, we just had to decrease the dose. So it's not an allergy. We just had to decrease that dose, stop it for a bit and start at a lower dose and then see how it affects you. And if it's fine, then it's completely fine. But the stuff that they talk about seeing like insects crawling up the walls, it, it can be horrific for some patients. So amazing drug, unfortunately has this really crazy hallucinogenic side effect but know that people are using this recreationally for this same effect, but voluntarily. Okay. Yeah. So it's a hero moment drug. Whenever I've been a pain registrar and someone's in excruciating pain, I get all my safety stuff ready, make sure that there's, you know, good monitoring and airway management equipment. And I might give 20 milligrams, like, you know, a one hour dose instantly 20 plus 20. I give a bit of midazolam. So they forget what's going on. And then it just cures their pain and gives me time while I can start an infusion of something or sort out why they've got pain. You won't be doing that as junior doctors, but just to know that it's a very useful drug for, you know, giving amazing pain release very, very quickly. 
that, that's it, guys. Um, any questions? Excellent. As always, so I'll um, yeah, put this up on the YouTube channel and uh, send out the um, information of, the, of these slides. And yeah, thanks for, thanks for participating. Good luck in the rest of Foundation Tim. I don't think there's too many weeks left, I believe. Is that right? Two weeks. Nice. Okay. If, you, if you've got time, you might see me another couple of times. Uh, so just to recap, what can I prescribe? Again, I want to give you solid answers for what you can actually do as an intern. What can I discharge my post-op patient with? Again, you'll be doing this when you're on the wards. I want you to offer to you know, prescribe this and then get your intern or resident to sign it for you. I want you to get used to doing it. So you want to be as involved as you can with your teams. And so definitely ask for that. And your knowledge in what I've given you today will help that happen. You'll be a very good medical student and very useful to the team if you're doing these like little tasks that you need to learn anyway. And you then allow, you know, your, um, you know, resident and registrar not to have to do that because they've taught you how to do that. Uh, you'll give them confidence by knowing this information. So that's important there. What are the risks? We've gone through just a few risks that are most important. We know how to prevent it by writing up the appearance and anti-nausea stuff and making sure we know how to use a bit of naloxone. Uh, you know, when to call, call the pain registrar and, you know, a bit about ketamine, the hero drug. Thanks very much, guys. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lahiri. Appreciate it. Thanks.